when you're minus your main helper <coughs> and you get the second string and between us we'll get it done. Uh, Acts chapter 17, if you will, with me this morning. We are uh, going to uh, start something I told you last year we were going to study. And I know it's March, but we had some other things to take care of. And uh, we're going to be looking at the doctrine of hell uh, the next couple weeks. I, uh, then we're going to go to heaven, so I'm not going to leave you in hell. Then we'll go to heaven, and uh, we'll uh, look around heaven and see what heaven's like. But uh, we're going to talk. I, I want to just spend the next couple weeks or three or four. Can you hear me okay? All right, good. Uh, or five or six or however long it takes. Uh, just looking at the, the issue of the doctrine of, uh, of hell of, of, or of eternal judgment, if you like to call it that. And uh, just kind of talk about it, uh, you know, really when you think about and you listen to other ministries and, and other teachers, hell isn't really talked about very often, except at the very end of the morning message where they give the altar call and the walk the aisle and they give all of that. And, and it's something that um, we should be very familiar with it as we do talk to people about their souls. And, uh, and as we talk to folks about their eternal salvation and where they're going to spend eternity, you need to know what you're talking about and just not, you know, say, hey, um, do you, if you were to die today, do you know where you'd spend eternity? Well, where is that? You know, where are you going to spend eternity? Well, are you going to spend it in heaven with, uh, with, with, with God or are you going to spend it in hell? And, you know, most of the time when you talk to people about hell, they think it's a party place and a place where... Uh, you know, me and my friends, and we're going to hang out and have a good time and so forth. And it really isn't. As we go back and look at Lazarus, and we peel back in Luke there, and we look at some things about what hell is about, it's really not that way <laughs> at all. So when we begin this morning, um, really I, I'm going to kind of take two lessons that we've done in the past and kind of put them together this morning and, and just kind of talk about that there, there is a hell and God, and then why God created hell. Because when you begin to talk about hell, in modern day Bible versions pull the word out, and, they use, and they'll put in Hades or Sheol. By the way, your Greek and your Hebrew, Hebrew is Sheol, S-H-E-O-L. It is the same word as hell. Uh, it's not, there isn't a different word for it. Uh, you, if you think there is and you've been taught and told something that's not right, Hades is the Greek word for hell. It's the same word as Sheol. Okay, now when you get over to Gehenna and the other words that are used for hell, then we're talking about something different. And we're going to look at that in, in our future studies and look at the garbage dump of the world and stuff like that, okay? But for, as we begin to look at the issue, and the fact is that Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul do teach about hell, and hell does play a very important role and a very important part of, of everything, of, 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 of not only the gospel and the salvation, but the plan. And they are there in Scripture, and, and the Scriptures are very clear about it. I had you go to Acts 17. If you're, if you're there, we, we are, Acts 17, you have Paul, he's at Thessalonica, he gets chased out. He goes to Berea. Then he ends up in Athens in verse 15. And they, and they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens. And receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the, whole, the city wholly given to idolatry. What did Paul see? He saw the whole city, what? Given over to idolatry, not worshiping the true God, but worshiping Diana, great as the goddess Diana, as they scream. And, and they're in the paganism. And then he comes to Mars Hill in verse 22. By the way, if you will notice, well, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens... I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Boy, what an attitude about religion. Superstition. Well, how do you know it's talking about religion, Rick? Look at the next verse. 
For as I passed by and beheld your devotions. Who does devotions? Religious people do devotions, don't they? Did you read your devotion this morning? You know, do you have your little devotional book? Did you go through Psalms? Have you read your proverb for the day? You know, 31 proverbs, 31 days in the month. It's superstitious. He says, I found in verse 23 an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. You see how, what did they have in their religion? They had all these shrines and statutes, and they had one to the unknown God. <clears throat> Isn't that like religious people to cover all their bases? <laughs> we'll name one to cover everything, just in case we missed one. And what does he say? Paul says, I want to talk to you about him. And I want you to, I want you to look at him with me this morning. God that made the world, verse 24, and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Folks, God doesn't need your help. And he's not in the church building. The building is a building. Where is he? He's in the church, the people. That's where he resides. He doesn't reside in a, in a religious shrine and in a church building and so forth. Now, by the way, it's nice to have a building. It's a tool that you use in doing the work of the ministry, and that's how you have to view it. But when you come to church you, and, you, and you meet with those of us of, of, uh, in fellowship around us with who we are in Christ, here's the church. The church is the people. Growing up, they had that little thing, you know, here's the church with the steeple. Open the door and there's all the people. Here's a church with no steeple. Open the door and there's no people. You know, so you got to, all that. That's what, that isn't where the church is. That isn't what Paul's, and Paul's like, guys, you guys are worshiping over here thinking you're, the Lord tell, tells them, don't pray as a heathen pray. They're in much reputation, uh, um, <clears throat> you know what I mean, okay? Fill in the blank, all right? Verse 26, And hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after Him, and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. Now watch verse 28. For in Him we live, and move, and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art or man's device. For the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to what? To repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that, by, <clears throat> by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him, notice this, from the dead. There's a message from Paul here on Mars Hill. And what does he say? He says, look, guys, you guys are all, in your religion, you've got all your bases covered, except you're missing the one true message. And that's the message from the man whom he, who God sent. And he's going to judge. And when he judges, he's going to judge based upon what Paul calls in Romans 2, my gospel. And in that gospel presentation, there is an issue of a judgment that's going to happen and a judging that's going to be there. And that judgment is hell, and the judgment is the lake of fire. If you go back up real quick to verse 18, Paul talked in there, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the what? The resurrection. Why? Because when Jesus died, the grave couldn't hold him. When the ladies come to the tomb and, the, and so forth, they say, he's not here. The angels said he's not here. He's what? He's risen. <clears throat> and Paul is, is he's pushing that, and he's forcing that issue here. 
with not only the philosophers, but the religious environment there on Mars Hill. And in that verse, in verse 31, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in what? In righteousness. God's righteousness. God's integrity, who He is, His essence is made up of righteousness, perfect righteousness, never, never wrong, never, never short, always perfect. And His judgment comes in and, and protects and guards His righteousness and His integrity. Yeah, by the way, His righteousness and His justice make up His integrity. Because when God looks at it and He says, this is perfect righteousness for you, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, for there is no difference. Short of what? The glory of God, that perfect righteousness. And His justice comes along, and you know what His justice demands? Perfect righteousness. And if you don't have it, there's a judgment. And when the judgment comes, the judgment is going to be hell and the lake of fire for those who do not have His perfect righteousness. You're in the Acts. Come over to chapter 24. By the, uh, by the way, go back to 13 just real quick here. Folks, a lot of times people say, well, Paul never you preached about hell in Paul's epistles. And I'll be honest with you, he doesn't talk about it a lot because how many times does he need to tell you if you die without being in Christ, you're going to go to hell? How many times does he have to tell you that Christ died for your sin, was buried and rose again the third day, and you trust in that, and immediately you get eternal life. Immediately you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Immediately you're blessed with all spiritual blessings. Immediately you're complete in Him. How many times does he have to tell you that? Just one time, the first five chapters of the book of Romans takes care of that. He doesn't have to continue to dwell on it, because in the rest of his epistles, in the rest of his writings, who's he talking to? People who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and are now moving on in their what? In their walk and in their Christian day and their Christian walk. He doesn't have to sit here and say, now don't forget about hell. Why? Because Christ paid for it and covered it all, took care of it. Acts 13, Paul preaches his first recorded message in Scripture publicly here at Antioch. <clears throat> Actually, he's in Pisidia. Antioch, Pisidia. Come over to verse number 38. He's at the end of this message. This message has been, is one of the recounts of the history of the nation of Israel. And he comes at 38, verse 38, Acts 13, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you, what? The forgiveness of sins. Notice that. He preached unto them, by, by the way, through this man. Which man? Jesus Christ. What, was, what did the law do to Israel? The law condemned them, didn't it? Said, you're, you can't do it. You're going to fail. You're guilty. You fail. You fail. You fail. But you need, if you're a failure, then what do you need? You need a helper, don't you? And the helper is Christ, and the law was designed to push Israel to Christ. Push Israel to the Messiah. Push Israel to Him. And he says, and this man now has preached the what? The forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Don't you think that turned everybody's ear a little bit? Why? Because they had been taught that they're justified by doing what? The law of Moses and being circumcised. Come over to Acts 24. Acts 24. So when we begin and introduce the doctrine of hell or the doctrine of eternal judgment, however you'd like to call it, I'm going to call it hell. It's easy to spell. Okay, and this is part one or part A. Okay, I don't have the overhead, so you just have to trust me. Verse 24 of chapter 24, Paul is before Felix. And after certain days, when Felix came with, with his wife, Dru, um, Dru, Drusilla, my goodness, man, today is not a day to say names, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. 
And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way, for this time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul that he might lose him. See, what was he looking for? He was looking for money. He was looking for a kickback. Get out of jail. Collect $200. Right? But notice in verse 25, what did Paul do with Felix? As he reasoned, Paul, concerning Paul, they, they sent for Paul. Paul stands before Felix and his wife, and what does he reason? Righteousness, temperance, and what? Judgment to come. What do you think the judgment to come was? You think he talked a little bit about hell and the lake of fire? And the thing that what did Felix need? Felix needed to do what? He needed to get saved. Bob Jones Sr., I, d- d- Dad always had quotes and I always wrote them down. And I got a little quote section. Bob Jones Sr. said it's better to be hell scared than hell scorched. What do you think Felix was getting the heat? He's getting the heat, judgment to come. So what does he do? He says, Paul, take him away. We've heard enough. And when it's convenient, I'll listen to him again and some more. Come over with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 2. You see, folks, when we talk about hell, hell's a real place. God created hell. Hell, Hell's tremendously important. It's not a doctrine to be ignored. It's not a doctrine to, to... to just overshadow and to, and to allow to go away. It's something that needs to, be, it needs to be addressed. It needs to be talked about. Romans chapter number 2. We start in verse number 2, but, but I want you to feel what's going on here in the, in the first chapters of Romans. Romans 1, Paul is introduced. Then he starts in verse 18. Romans 1:18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against how, many, how much ungodliness? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What is the now, today, in the age of grace, what's been revealed? The wrath of God against what? All of it. All of the unrighteousness. All of the ungodliness. He, he's holding his wrath back. It's a day of his grace. He's not imputing their trespasses to him. If he imputed their trespasses to him, what would he have to do to the world? Wipe it out. Judge it completely. He says, I'm not doing that. I've changed the dispensation. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hold that back for a day coming. Right now I'm dispensing my grace. But we're going to talk about the wrath. And you know what Paul does? Paul begins, if you you flip over to chapter 3 and verse 9. Chapter 3 and verse 9. What then are we, and the we there is the Jews, better than they, and the they is Israel. What then are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before, what's that word? Proved both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under what? Sin. Starting in chapter 1, verse 18, to to chapter 3, verse 21, Paul is laying out as a lawyer would in a court of law, and he's coming to the conclusion that there are none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all sinners. Everybody is a sinner. And he starts in chapter 1, verse 18, and he begins to deal with and he begins to lay out what the, how the heathen think and how unsaved people operate and they think. And you get down to the depths of it in verse number 32 of chapter 1 where he says, Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Not, folks, don't you ever think that unsaved people don't know what they're doing because that verse says they do. They know that there's a judgment of God coming. That's what verse 19 and 20 and 21 are talking about, how that they're, they understand that there is somebody out there bigger than they. And he's God. Now what does religion do? They put a happy face on him. And they make things a little different. They attribute a different name or whatever. And they do their thing. But there's some, and one day what's going to happen? They're going to stand in judgment. 
So what does man do? Well, he gave, God gave them up three times. Body, soul, and spirit. There they were, gone. Turn them over. Turn them over to themselves. He does that historically in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel. Genesis 12, do you know who showed up in Genesis 12? Abraham. And he pulls Abraham out. By the way, Abraham's a Gentile. He's a dirty, rotten sinner. God chose him, says, and you and your seed, now I'm going to have a nation. And he begins the nation of Israel. But what did he do? He gave them up. Then in chapter 2, which is where I'm trying to get to, <laughs> thou, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou, for thou that judgest do, doest the same things. Now he's going to come and talk to the guy who, who's a heathen, but he's not a bad guy. He's the Boy Scout, you know, the good guy. He, he, have you ever dealt with someone, because I, I have, and you, and you make a comment and they say, well, my grandmother told me differently. You never go against grandma. Because then you're going to have to duck. Well, we're talking about grandma now. And the people who now think that they are what? That they're going to get their, their, their righteousness is gonna, was what's going to get them through the door. By the way, in chapter 2, you start in verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew. Then in 17, now down into chapter 3, who does he deal with? He deals with the Jew because the Jew thinks they're special. Are they special? They are in the eyes of God. They're His people. But in the dispensation of grace, what are they? They're sinners, and they need salvation. Okay? Now, coming back into chapter 2, verse 2. <clears throat> but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which committeth such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? You see that moral issue there? The, more, the high ground. Well, we have the high ground, and, and we're going to cast judgment. And yet, what are they doing over here? They're doing the same thing you're casting judgment over. And, and Paul says, don't you think the judgment of God, because the judgment of God is according to truth. You think you're going to escape because you wore a shirt and a tie? He says, you better think again. Verse 3, verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? What leads you to repentance, folks? The goodness of God. Look at that. The goodness. <coughs> Of God is what leads you. What, well, where do you see the goodness of God? At the cross. But God committed His love toward us, and not while we were yet sinners. What? Christ died for us. Boy, is that, that's good. Because what does it take care of? It takes care of the judgment of God, which is according to truth. It answers the judgment. Verse 5, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Man, look at, uh, he's, what are you, what are you, what, what are they getting in verse 5? They're getting wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, aren't they? What, are they getting anything good? It's all bad, isn't it? It's, it's rough. It's tough. Come with me to the book of the Revelation. This is where this day of judgment is. This is where the wrath is. <coughs> by not mentioning hell, by not talking about hell, it's a failure to maintain it. By removing it from our conversations when we're dealing with people, by not, uh, did I tell you where to go in Revelation? Uh, we'll start, we're going to start in verse four, chapter 14. By not dealing with the issue of hell and what's going on in it, and by not at least having it in your thinking, what begins to, to, take, what begins to happen is the adversary begins to win the battle. Because the adversary doesn't want hell talked about, because that's the judgment of God according to truth. He would rather you talk about something else. And Paul says, no, you better pay attention 
because it's important and it's critical. Revelation 14. We're in the book of the Revelation here, but I, I just want you to, that day of judgment, Revelation 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and the image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. So in the tribulation out there in the 70th week of Daniel, when the mark of the beast is instituted, which is in the midst of the week, if you take it, Israel, Nate, anybody, by, by the way, the body of Christ, we're in heavenly places, we're not here, okay? What's going to happen to you? The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their, what? Torment. Ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. See, oh, we don't, don't take the mark of the beast. But why not take the mark of the beast? Because what are you going to get? You're going to get the righteous judgment of God according to truth. You're going to get torments. Now, look, look at this in verse 10. Shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without what? Mixture. Have you ever grabbed a thing of lemon juice you got, and you took a drink of it thinking it was lemonade? Now, what's the difference between lemon juice and lemonade? It's called sugar, <laughs> right? It's not exactly pleasing, is it, to just go whoop? Without what? Mixture. They're going to taste of the wrath of God, and it's not going to be diluted. It's going to be hot. It's going to be heavy. It's going to be tormented with fire and brimstone. And it's tormented... In verse 11, forever and ever and ever. It will never stop. It will never cease. It will always be there. Hold on to here and run back with me to Matthew chapter number 8. Matthew chapter number 8. You see, folks, hell's not a nice place. Hell is a place that you have to be aware of. And hell is a place that you can praise the Lord that you're not going there because you're secure in Him. Matthew 8, verse number 5, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto Him a centurion beseeching Him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously, what? Tormented. The torment in Scripture is a physical torment. And, and when in Revelation 14 is a description of, a, of, of the soul in hell, and it's a torment of their inner man, and it's forever and ever and ever. Come back to Revelation, but come over to chapter 19. Chapter 19 in verse number 20. Chapter 19 in verse number 20. It's a place that's going to be tormented. It's going to have physical torment. It's going to have... It's going to be a place that's going to afflict the souls of men, the inner man. Revelation 19, 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. They, these both were cast, what? Alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. They're cast, what? Alive, chapter 20, verse 10. Here comes Satan, the false prophet and the beast. The beast is the Antichrist. The, false, he, the Antichrist is the political wing. The false prophet is the religious wing of, of, the, of the satanic policy of evil against the earth and against God's program and against God's people. And now look at 2010 and look at what happens to the devil after the Gog and Magog invasion. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet, what's that next word? Are. They haven't died. Satan's been bound for a thousand years here, folks. They've been in that lake of fire for a thousand years and the false prophet and the beast are still what? Still alive. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Chapter 22.
chapter 21, I'm sorry, 21, 8. 21, 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That covers them all, doesn't it? Boy, if, but the fearful and what? Unbelieving. You may not be a murderer or a whoremonger or the other guys, and you may not tell every lie in the book. You may just whisper one every now and then. But you're, if you're unbelieving, where are you headed? You're headed to hell, to the lake of fire. Now come back to Mark 9 with me. When you talk about, uh, folks, I understand that it's not a nice subject, but it's a subject that we should be versed in and we should maintain and not give up and not allow to be taken away from us by the religious scene out there. And when you deal with people and you talk and when you're dealing with yourself and you think about it this morning for yourself, think about there's a place where the wrath of God is being poured out without mixture. And it's forever, and it's torments, it's a physical torment, and it's day and night. Mark 9, he's going to describe here. You start in verse 42, and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, the Lord is talking here, that believe in me. And the little ones there aren't the children, by the way, the little children suffer them to come. The little ones here, this is the little flock. He's being very very specific here the believers the believing remnant of israel it is better for him that is that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he was cast into the sea and if thy hand offend thee cut it off it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched Notice that. Notice the warning here. It's better to go into life maimed than to have two hands and end up where? In hell. Verse 45. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. For it is better for thee to enter into the what? The kingdom of God. Notice that. With one eye, then having two eyes to be cast into... Now watch what he says here. Hellfire. Now watch how he changed. What did he say? It's better for you to cut off your hand than to go into what? Life. Well, if we're talking about the kingdom of God, what kind of life are we talking about? We're talking about eternal life here. Where do they have eternal life? It's in the kingdom of God. So as they come through the 70th week of Daniel, and they, they're doing and they're, and they're keeping themselves and they're keeping their garments from being spotted and they're not buying into the religious program of the Antichrist, and they're, they're doing what they're, they're... They're the overcomers. He says, man, it's better for you to cut something off to and go on into eternal life, into the kingdom of God, than it is to say, no, I want to have right now and to spend eternity in hellfire. You think it's important? I think it's important. Now watch the next verse, verse 48 and 49. Because it tells you what kind of fire we're dealing with here. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be... Salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, and off you go. Salted with what? What kind of fire? What does salt do? It's a preservative, isn't it? We watched this Alaska, the last frontier show on Discovery. You know, hey, there you go. The last Mohegans or whatever, you know, the other shows, they got them all out there, the last... The last mountain men and all this stuff. And you know what they do? They go out, they fish, they hunt, they come in, and they smoke it, and they pack that stuff down with salt to preserve it. You know what kind of fire this is? This is a preserving fire. It's a fire that's not going to burn it up into a crispy the, where you don't, can't recognize it. It's rather going to be a fire that's going to maintain, and it's going to 
hold. And it's going to preserve. That means you're going to still be alive. It's going to be tormented. And you're going to be tormented day and night. That's not a good place to be. Come over with me to Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number in Matthew 5 where the Sermon on the Mount and you have the Beatitudes come over to verse 29 and if thy right eye offend thee pluck it out and cast it from thee for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell that's sobering folks you ought to pay attention to that so hell's real. It's a real place. It's real hot, by the way. I don't know about you. In the summer times, you, you, you see that valley of death, and they show that temperature on there, and they say it's the hottest place and blah, blah, blah. Well, there's a place hotter, okay, and it's called hell. It's centrally located in the center of the earth. It's a spirit realm. We'll peel back the crust of the earth and we'll look down in it. But it's, it's true and it's hot. You're in Matthew. Come over to Matthew 25. And it's something that is there. It's something that God created. And in Matthew 25, you, you see the verse, where, why, who he created it for. It's real. It's hot. It's physical. It's, a, it's in the spirit realm because it's dealing with your inner man, your soul. There are different degrees in it. There are different levels in it. Of, of, but it's all torment, by the way. I mean, you think about the little grandma or the old lady or the old man who's done nothing wrong, has all lived, li lived a moral life, just never they rejected the gospel, and he dies. Where does he go? Absent from the body is present in hell. It's still torment. It just won't be as hot as it's going to be for the devil. But it's still what? Still torment. Okay? Matthew chapter 25, the, sex, the context is verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. So where are we in this context? We're in the kingdom. He's on His glory. He's on His throne of glory. And He's going to divide up the nations. And before Him shall be gathered all nations. Now, this all nations are the Gentiles. This is not Israel. Israel has already been secured and, and identified as the true Israel of God. And they're set. And He's going to look at the Gentile nations now and He's going to divide them up. And He's going to put the goats on one hand and the sheep on the other. And the sheep, he tells them, verse 34, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom of, prepared for you from the, world, from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat, and I was thirsty. And what, is, what do the sheep nations do, the Gentile nations? What have they done? They've blessed Israel, haven't they? He says, when you did this to the littlest one of my brethren, you did it to me. You practiced the Abraham covenant, and boom, you're in. Come on in. It's ready for you. Then he turns to the goats. <laughs> and he says, verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, By the way, you're my left hand. Sorry. Okay. Law side, gray side. All right. There you go. Amen. I'm just, it's just for the morning. Okay. <laughs> then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Why did God create hell? He created it originally for the devil and his angels. So if he created it originally for the devil and his angels, then why all of a sudden do, do men go there now? And then when did he create heaven? I'm sorry, hell. He created it where? Before he ever created who? Man. It was already there. So then what happened? We'll come back to Ezekiel 28. Because a couple things happened. <clears throat> Genesis 1.1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. 
verse 2 says, And the earth was without form and void, right? So something happened between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. And I, and I know what happens. Everybody says it's a gap, you know, you believe in a gap theory. Whatever. You can call it whatever you want. Something happened there. Because when he created heaven and earth, it was perfect. And then all of a sudden, verse 2 says it's without form and void. That's a judgment title. That's judgment talk. Actually, it's talk in Jeremiah that, that equates to um, his second coming. Ezekiel 28. I'm trying to give you time to get there because I'm not there yet. Ezekiel 28. In that period between which causes the judgment to fall out is the fall of Satan, of Lucifer, Ezekiel 28. And when Lucifer fell, Ezekiel 28, verse number 12, Son of man, take up the lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Who's in Eden? Who was in Eden? Lucifer, Satan, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Adam and Eve. So we know he's not really talking to the king of Tyrus, the man. He's talking to the guy behind the man who's pulling the strings. Every precious stone was thy covering, and he begins to describe him in verse 13. Verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in him. 1 Timothy 3 says pride got him. It's pride that got him. That was the iniquity. You think about this. When we go to heaven and we look at the throne room of God, and the floor in the throne room of God is made out of these stones. And in and, and and Psalms it calls it as a molten sea gla of, of, of glass. It's like a mirror. Now you think about Lucifer, the anointed cherub that covereth. By the way, a cherub is one of the few of the angelic hosts that have wings. Angels don't have wings. They have the appearance of a man. Okay, we studied angels. You should, that should ring a bell. He's looking down, and what does he see? His reflection. And boy, he's pretty good looking, ain't he? By the way, when you bend light through these stones, you know what you get? You get a rainbow. That's where the rainbow comes from. It's off the throne room of God. Pride got him. You're in Ezekiel, flip back to Isaiah. When pride got him, he came up with the plan. Isaiah 14. Here's his plan. Just real quickly here, for time's sake, okay? Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. He come up with the plan. And he had an I will plan. By the way, when he says there that thou wast in the holy mountain of God, Job 1 and Job 2, he's up there in the mountain, the north in the congregation, Okay? And he's been, and, and God looks at Satan and says, where have you been? He goes, I've been down walking to and fro in the earth and stuff. That's all that's connected. Isaiah 14, as Satan is being cast into the lake of fire, out there in Revelation where we were reading a minute ago, the nation of Israel is going to stand and mock him. And they're going to mock him with this here in Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which did, didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, and that's where the pride got him, I will exalt, I'm sorry, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The stars of God in your Bible at this point are angels, the angelic host. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That's Job 1 and 2. That's the place in the sides of the north. Actually on earth, it's in the Lebanon area where they come in and there's an, an accounting given of the activity of the angelic host and what they've been doing. That's why God asked Satan, where have you been? What have you been doing? He says, I'm going to control that. I'm going to exalt. I'm going to sit as the judge. I will ascend upon the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. 
yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And they're going to mock you. And they're going to say, hey, here's your plan. Remember your plan? <laughs> Look at where you're going now. Not didn't work out too good for you, did it? And you know what? When Satan falls and he lays out his plan, by the way, do you see anything in here about power and might? It's all wisdom. Romans chapter 1. Just put some verses together. Get Romans 1 and get Daniel 11. Daniel 11 and Romans 1. <clears throat> Romans 1, Daniel 11. Romans 1, 25. Here's the satanic policy of evil. Here's the plan of attack. I will. I'm going to do this. I will be like the Most High. You go over to Genesis and that most in Genesis there with Abraham. Genesis 14, the Most High God is defined as possessor of heaven and earth. I'm going to be like Him. I'm going to possess it. I'm going to control it. Romans 1 verse 25, here's how He is going to do it. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. What did He do? He came up with a wisdom plan of changing the truth of God into a lie, and he caused the creature to be worshipped more than the Creator. And when he did it, he got the angelic host. Now, go to Daniel 11. Actually, it's Daniel 10. I'm sorry, Daniel 10. When Satan went after the angels, because that would have been the only thing created at that time would have been the angelic host, he didn't go to the bottom dwellers. He went to the upper echelon. And when the verse over there talks about him taking a third of the angels, my own personal private opinion of it is he's, not, he's talking about the top tier guys. And he's, if, if your boss comes in and says, we're going to do this now, are you going to say, no, we're not? Or are you going to say, yeah, we are? You're going to pretty much follow along, aren't you? Look at Daniel 10. You have Gabriel coming and talking with Daniel. And he's withstood. And verse 13, he's got to get Michael to come and help him out and, 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 the, and the angelic host and so forth. But what I want you to hold, look at is verse 21. But I will show thee, and this is Gabriel talking to Daniel. I, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. If Gabriel tells Daniel there's nobody out there but him and Michael, then what do you think is going on in the angelic host? The top echelon is where? It's gone. It's been taken by Satan and his lie program. When that happened, go back there to Matthew 25 now. Matthew 25. What did God do? God did not destroy the, them. You notice that. God didn't reach out and snuff out Lucifer and start over. He allowed it to happen. Because he had a plan, didn't he? He had a wisdom plan. So what did God do? God said, I know how to stop the rebellion and the angelic host. I'm going to create a little hell, a place called hell. Verse 41, depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's amazing, isn't it? You see, folks, hell is real. It's hot. It's a physical torment. It's a place you're going to go unless you're in Christ. It was originally intended for the, for the devil and his angels. Now, who came on the scene in Genesis? Man did. And when man came on the scene, what did Lucifer do? I can get this guy. Watch this. And he went down and took care of Adam and Eve, didn't he? And one felt swoop. What you need? Matthew 25, 41. Okay, I'm sorry. Matthew 25, 41. He took care of Adam and Eve in one fell swoop, didn't he? And God said, okay, Adam, you lost your light and removed you, removed him 
set up the cherubs to protect the tree of life. I said, okay, Adam, now you've got to do animal sacrifice, and you've got to come to me my way now. You were just like me. Now you've got to come the way I want you to come. And how you're going to have to come now is through a sacrifice. And if it's going to be an animal, and we're going to get you clothed in skins, and we'll get you set up, but you're going to have to bring a, a sacrifice now. And a sacrifice is the only way for you to come to me now. And he institutes with Adam animal sacrifice right there in Genesis 3 and 4. Adam teaches Cain and Abel. What did Cain do? Brought of his own works, didn't he? Abel brought of the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. You're going to have to come my way now because what? what's happened? Sin has entered into the picture. And now because man has sin, man's destiny is hell. Without man's destiny, man without the sacrifice destiny is hell. It's the torment. It's the judgment. It's their unrighteousness. The sacrifice is what's needed. The covering and the shedding of blood is what's needed to make everything okay in the eyes of God. To satisfy His justice, you have to have perfect righteousness. Adam, you're going to get it in that sacrifice. Abraham, in that sacrifice. Israel, in that sacrifice. That Passover lamb's got to be slain. You come to the Apostle Paul, and he says, Christ is our Passover lamb. Christ has hung at Calvary and shed the blood that's needed to take care of the justice of God that's going to say your judgment is hell, the lake of fire. Romans chapter 3. You see, folks, we're not talking about religion. Honestly, we're not talking about walking the aisle. We're not talking about getting water baptized. We don't even have a place for that to happen here unless you want the sink in the bathroom we're talking about faith in the sacrifice that's required to, to save your soul from hell God created it because it was sin that entered into his creation and in order to stop the rebellion he creates hell in, store, in order to stop the rebellion of the angelic host out there, he creates hell. And it stopped, by the way, the moment it was created. And in order to stop the rebellion of man, he create, he adds hell. By the way, we're going to look at a passage in Isaiah. When Abraham's bosom is removed and gone up, hell enlarges its, itself, Isaiah says. Because it's getting ready for who? For the souls of men not saved. And you can say, well, what, what kind of a cruel God would do that? It's not a cruel God, it's a loving God. Because a loving God said, that's, the, that's what my justice demands and requires, but I've given you a provision in the sacrifice that will appease and take care of that just, just, justice requirement. Romans 3, verse number 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Boy, you've got to love the Bible terms. Propitiation, fully satisfying payment. God set forth a propitiation. He set the sacrifice there. Through faith in His what? In His blood to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness, that He might be just and justifier of Him which, what? Believeth in Jesus. There's the sacrifice. Paul says that the gospel that you've believed is that Christ died for your sins, according to the Scriptures. And he was buried and he rose again the third day according to... The, he, 
He is the sacrifice. Verse 22, he says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified, what's that word? Freely, by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Folks, hell's a tough place. We're going to look at it, dissect it. It's not a place you want to go and spend eternity. It's not a place you want to go and spend a, a, a nanosecond. It's a place that he says, I had to do that because of sin and rebellion and iniquity and ungodliness. I had to do that, but I gave you a way out of it, and it's at Calvary. I gave the sacrifice, and you just simply have to believe him and trust him. For the wages of sin is death. It's appointed unto man once to die, then the what? Then the judgment. And that judgment is the second death, and that's the death of your soul in hell. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And where you're salted with fire, and you're preserved, and you're tormented day and night. You want a way out? I sure would like one. Calvary is the door to get out. Got to think about that. I hope this week you think about hell. And praise the Lord that you're out. If you're here this morning and you're not out, or you don't know if you're out, it's so simple. It's unto all and upon all them that believe. It's amazingly how simple it is. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Again, folks, we're not talking about walking the aisle. We're not talking about even talking to me. We're talking about in the privacy of your heart where you sit, simply placing your faith on the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, folks, it's better to be hell scared than hell scorched. And hell is not a place you want to go. Not when there's been a provision provided. Okay? Now we're going to move forward. We're going to look at hell dispensationally. We're going to look at it in time past. We're going to look at it in but now. We're going to look at it out in the ages to come. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the instructions here. We thank you for the simplicity that is in the gospel. And we thank you for the simplicity that's in Christ. And Lord, I pray that if there is someone here this morning or who hears my voice on the internet, that they would consider the issues of hell and be certain that if they were to die today, they would spend eternity in heaven. And that's because they've been to Calvary. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, we'll stand, be dismissed.